This presentation gives a brief overview of the development of archaeological embroidery, showing that it does not have to be an appendage to archaeological textiles um, and possible future research avenues. Um, and individual case studies will focus on the early medieval period, which I say is around 450 to 1100. That's my main area of interest. The majority of archaeological embroideries have, until my PhD project, been studied as a decorative feature on the textile on which it was worked. Exceptions do occur, however, even in the majority of these cases, once the threads, ground fabric and stitches are defined, other related themes are rarely explored. A description of how the stitch is constructed and comparative examples may be given, but then the discussion inevitably turns to the design, art historical and general history of the object on which it's found. As a result, archaeological embroideries have been immersed in an art historical survey or the subdiscipline of archaeological textiles, leading to a shared use of analysis and terminology. So in this presentation, I'm focusing on embroidery as archaeology, and therefore the discipline of archaeological textiles, drawing out relevant points to push forward the idea that embroideries can actually be studied as objects in their own right and how this impacts on their post-excavation journeys, although people here may disagree. <laughs> okay. So embroideries, due to their fragile nature, rarely survive within the archaeological context. Um, and this was compounded when archaeology was an embryonic subject, an antiquarian interest, with textiles and embroidery often, although not always, being considered not worthwhile. They weren't shiny. Um, and this led to some excavated examples being discarded, while others were documented and sent to private collections. Some, such as the Kempston fragments, survived, but others were lost, or due to a lack of understanding about their storage needs, um, disintegrated. Um, for example, the 5th to 6th century fragment from Alfriston Cemetery in Sussex may have been lost or it may have disintegrated. During the 19th century, with the establishment of museums such as the South Kensington Museum, now the V&A, uh, textiles and embroidery took on new importance, uh, being collected for display and educational purposes. This, combined with a developing interest in medieval religion and Opus Anglicanum embroidery, meant embroidery came under greater scholarly scrutiny, which led to more examples being documented and collected from excavations. The advent of the 20th century saw the development of technical and scientific analysis of archaeological textiles, and as a result, embroidery. One of the earliest and most important figures in this development was Ada Grace Christie. In 1938, she published a seminal work, English Medieval Embroidery, which focused on medieval ecclesiastical embroideries, including the early medieval stole, maniple and probable ribbons from the tomb of St Cuthbert in Durham. Christie was the first person um, to, with expertise in making embroidery to analyse how these pieces were created. She described in detail the materials, designs and stitches and how they were worked. She used scientific methods such as microscopes and had materials chemically tested. Now, not all her results proved to be accurate, but she was groundbreaking. The next major leap came with the development of textile archaeology. And in the United Kingdom, this subject was developed by mother and daughter team Grace and Elizabeth Crowfoot. It is these two ladies and their protégés that developed the form of study and types of data still collected today. And this developed into a technical analysis of facts, of data that can be tabled and quantified. Standardised classification schemes were developed so that the results, if and when, when if they were published, um, textiles could be compared to each other. Although there were issues in direct comparisons, leading to Lena Hammerland, a trained spinner and weaver, to create the Pentagon system, uh, which enables different textiles to be compared through the correlation of five yarn properties. Susanna Harris discusses these developments and their issues in her forthcoming article, The Sens Sensory Archaeology of Textiles. It's a good article. All of this data is important and useful. But as Harris points out, it isolates researcher experience of textiles. There is no description of interaction, of sensory engagement with the textile or embroidery, which are sensory objects in themselves. One cannot answer questions about how the embroidery felt to touch, 
to where, how it moved if worn or was hung. The visual engagement interpretation brought about by, for example, the early medieval mind, something so different from our own. Embro did embroidery smell because of the materials used in its creation and the chemical interaction between it, the creator, and the then user, wearer? What noises could be heard when it was made, used, etc.? And these are questions that require a deeper engagement with the embroideries. However, such engagement is often compromised by how researchers can access, view, analyse and interact with the embroideries. This is often due to how they've been stored, um, a result of their need to be stabilised and protected. Storage up to the mid-1990s, and some of the curators may disagree with this, this is just one example, um, but it is illustrated by the 7th century embroidery from Kempston, Bedfordshire. The embroidery was discovered on the 18th of January 1864 in a bronze box located next to a body in an excavated grave. It then disappears until March 1891 when a Miss Anne Scott wrote to the British Museum asking if the board would consider purchasing the artefacts from Kempston that she owned for the sum of £100. Um, the board obviously agreed because these objects, including the embroidery in its container, are now housed there. The piece was examined by Elizabeth Crowfoot in the 1970s and although she does not describe how it was being stored, she records that it had already been separated from its small alloy, copper alloy container. So again, there's a sensorial um, disruption there. The embroidery was mounted at some point after it had been studied by Crowfoot and prior to my own visit in the early 2000s. Although the museum has no record of the conservation and the incumbent textile conservator suggests it probably took place before 1994 when she came to work at the BM and the type of clips used to hold the objects in place changed. So it's laid out on a plywood board that's been covered in a layer of melanix, polyester film, and a cushion of polyester waddy was placed on top and encased in a conservation fabric, probably cotton. The embroidery was laid on the cotton and it's allowed to sink into the polyester cushion to relieve strain and stress in the fibres. Um, a piece of conservation plastic, probably perspex, um, is positioned over the top and held in place with the two perspex clips. Um, the embroidery is kept in a pull-out museum drawer in the stores of the BM. This approach to storage is good for stabilising embroidery, but it means it's difficult for researchers to analyse the piece in detail, particularly the reverse, where much of the constructional information is hidden. This technique has since been complemented by two other forms, both of which have been used by the Durham Conservation Centre. The first, used for loose fragments of the Cuthbert stole, consists of stitching the embroidery onto conservation netting. You can see that up here, you can see there are long white, very thin lines, those are the stitches holding it in place. And the whole is then sandwiched between two pieces of conservation perspex, which is held together in a frame, which you can just see in this image here. Um, this technique supports the embroidery and allows observers to view the front and the reverse. However, the net can distort the view, especially when photographed, um, as you can see here. The second technique um, involves cutting the shape of the embroidery out of conservation perspex to create a snug cavity in which the object is placed. Then a lid of the same is secured over the top. This system supports the embroidery whilst giving the observer visible access to both the front and the reverse. Um, it's excellent for pr protecting the embroidery and for giving the researcher visible access. And for the type of data collection archaeological textile researchers generally undertake, this is a good compromise. However, for the type of sensory engagement I'm exploring, it is limiting. Few archaeological embroideries are on permanent display due to their fragile nature. So this means that researchers need to access the embroideries within a controlled environment. Access has changed a lot since they were first housed in museums and other institutions. Um, Grace and Elizabeth Crowfoot would travel to a museum to analyse textiles, um, but there's also evidence that pieces were sent directly to their house in Norfolk and they were allowed to cut threads and small pieces and unpick things mm. for further examination. I'd love to be able to do that. But mm. part of me is like, no, don't. Um, these samples they often kept, again, another no-no, 
Um, indeed, I was given an old box of metal plasters once owned by Elizabeth and inside it contained small packets of gold threads that she'd kept from the vestments at Durham and Winchester. They date to the early medieval period and slightly after that. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to keep them. Um, and so after I'd analysed them and repacked them in modern packages, I was very professional and I handed the whole thing back. It did take me over a year though. <laughs> Today, strict protocols have been put in place with regard to access. Um, if an object is to be analysed um, and conserved by a specialist, um, it may be sent to their place of work. If, however, a scholar requires access for general research purposes, they, they will have to view the embroidery in-house. To view the Kempston embroidery, I had to request permission from the curator. Once agreed, an appointment was made. The embroidery was taken out of storage to the study room for the period of study. I was allowed to photograph it with a digital camera and take microscopic images using a USB microscope. I had to handle the embroidery while wearing gloves, although I was not allowed to take it out of its protective case. Um, and this procedure is similar from what I've encountered in most, but not every setting. Right, I'm really sorry about the plug, but I thought this was a more interesting front cover than my thesis one. Um, so this form of access set against um, some object biography theory and some meshwork theory enabled me to undertake my PhD research which demonstrated that archaeological embroideries did not have to be seen simply as decoration on textile. My work focused on drawing out the stories of early medieval embroidery and this incorporated technical information about their construction but went on to discuss the workers, training, development of embroidery production and the evolution and use of materials and design through the period. I then drew out themes relating to the embroideries, linking them to society and its evolution from tribes to an established kingdom and the conquest in 1066. The result was a detailed analysis of early medieval society, particularly in England, and how it thought and interacted with the world around it, as evidenced through surviving embroideries and documentary, literary, artistic and archaeological evidence relating to embroideries and their producers. This research demonstrated that it is possible to study archaeological embroideries as a discrete scholarly subject, but also generated new questions about what we can learn from and about these objects. So for me now, the question is, how can we immersively engage with these fragile objects in order to develop a more nuanced understanding of how the people at the time of construction, use and deposition actually perceived and understood them? Technical data is an important aspect of this because it gives us information about the types of materials, dyes, etc. that were available and their processing. It tells us how embroidery was made, but it does not explain how the embroidery fitted into society. Obviously, researchers can't go around demanding that embroideries be taken out of their cases. And this means we have to be creative about our approaches to research. So I propose we use traditional forms of data collection to enable experimental work to help us engage with sensory aspects of embroidery. Um, and this is an avenue Susanna Harris is developing with archaeological textiles from prehistory. So once the raw data has been collected, the embroidery can be stabilised and protected using techniques that allow the front and reverse to be seen. This data can then be used in conjunction with evidence gathered from other sources, archaeology, documentary, artistic, to give a detailed overview. Um, the data, along with other forms of evidence, could then be used to generate experimental work, the recreation of parts or whole of the embroidery using methods and tools based on those from the period in question. So I'm a professional embroidery, embroiderer and I'm in the process of um, working such an experiment, recreating part of the Cuthbert Maniple. And this has become a collaborative process. The weaver and I work out the finest versus strength of the silk threads on the ground fabric. The embroidery threads have involved much discussion about what the published report actually means in relation to working practices and colour. And this is an exciting project, but I've since thought that it could be taken further. All aspects of the creating process could be recorded through photography and video, whilst words describing the physical and mental interactions with the making process, sound, weight, density, smell, how your arms, neck and back feel, could give insights into how and what the original workers may have felt and expressed. Eva Anderson Strand has been working on a project recording spinners with motion caption and the system used to make Gollum in Lord of the Rings. 
and she's exploring the minute actions undertaken by <coughs> spinners to understand how they affect the resulting thread. And this use of such technology opens up innovative prospects for sensory orientated research. Um, recording sensory experiences is not limited to the makers. Again, Susanna Harris has undertaken sensory experiments with recreated garments. She's asked people to tell her their experiences of engaging with them. And although the results tell us what people experience and perceive today, it gives researchers insight and a springboard from which to build their work. And such activities could be taken further, engaging museums and schools, for example. It may even start new projects like that of the Langors textile stroke embroidery which was recreated using modern materials and turned into an opera performed by local people. So in this way, post-excavation journeys of archaeological embroideries continue in new and diverse ways while researchers reach back to their origins, immersing themselves into the embroidery sensorial environment and learning how past societies engaged and experienced them in worlds so very different from our own.